Hey YouTube, this is Brian. Today we're going to be talking about Python IDEs. An IDE, if you're not familiar with it already, is an integrated development environment. If you've been doing any programming or data science already, you're probably already familiar with IDEs. You probably even have one that you already prefer. This is for those who aren't yet familiar with IDEs I'm gonna, or aren't yet familiar with IDEs that are focused on Python. I know when I was first switching to Python, I was coming from R and was used to R Studio, and R Studio had kind of spoiled me, and so I was looking for something that was essentially a clone of R Studio and offered all of the functionality that R Studio offers in a Python-based environment, and I wasn't able to find that, so there was a little bit of frustration. So this is sort of to help you move beyond that, show you what the options are, and give you some suggestions for what I have found works well based on my experience. I'm not going to go into too much detail about what an IDE actually is. The short summary of it is that it's a code editing platform and it's essentially a text editor on steroids. So IDEs often offer lots of other things bundled with the software above text editing or above source code editing, but that's really usually the focus. That's the main reason that they exist. So if you want to know more about what IDEs do and offer in general, you can follow the link here to the Wiki Wikipedia article about IDEs, and that will give you some more information. But for now, we're just going to sort of call it a, a text editor on steroids and move on. There are three main options, I think, for Python data science development. The first is Jupyter Notebooks, and that's the one that we're going to be focusing on today, so I won't talk too much about it yet. Uh, the other two are Spider and Rodeo. If you're familiar with RStudio, these are going to feel much more uh, natural to you and you should probably go check those out if you really are turned off from Jupyter Notebooks or if you just want to see what else is out there. I've tried both of those, used them for a while, and ended up coming back to Jupyter Notebooks and so that's what I'm going to focus on and that's where I feel most comfortable at the, this moment but feel free to go out and give those a shot and see what feels most natural to you. Okay so with that said let's go ahead and start talking about Jupyter Notebooks. Just a little bit of history. Jupyter Notebooks evolved out of a project called IPython Notebooks. IPython Notebooks was very focused on Python. Jupyter is a fork of that project that expands support to other languages. IPython, the I in IPython, focused on interactivity. So this is a web-based framework that focuses on allowing you to write some code and then get some output write some more code, and then get some output. This is in contrast to some other IDEs that focus on writing code, then compiling, and then later running that code. So there's not compiling that happens in Jupyter Notebooks, it's writing the code and then getting some output. And that works well if you're doing data science, so you're writing uh, some code to create some uh, computations, and then you want to see the result of those computations. You don't want to have to wait for them to compile and then run them in an up, a separate application. You want to do the work, write the code, and then get your output from it. If you have followed the previous videos and you have, you're have you using the Anaconda distribution, you've already got Jupyter Notebooks installed. You don't have to do anything else. So let's see how it works. The first thing you're going to want to do is set aside specific projects or specific folders for each of your projects. This is something I do naturally, so this isn't a big deal to me. But if it's not something that you do already, you might want to set up a projects folder, and within that projects folder, have folders for each of your separate projects. The reason you do that, especially when you're working with Jupyter Notebooks, is because by default, Jupyter will save the files you're working with to the directory in which the server that runs Jupyter on the back end was opened. And that'll make a little bit more sense as we get into it here. So let me show you how that works. As I said, I've got specific project set up, so I'm just going to go to my projects folder. I'm going to hunt down the Jupyter examples folder, and then I'm going to head to that. It's something that I always forget to do, and you need to do this regardless of what IDE you're working in because you want to open the IDE in the correct environment. But something that I almost always forget to do is start my Conda environment. And again, if you followed through the previous videos, you'll know what I'm talking about here. If not, go back and check out the second video where we talk about in Conda environments and I talk about some of the benefits of working with them. I have an environment I opened in the last video called Monkey Town. Let's go ahead and bring that up. Source activate Monkey Town. 
All right, so now we can see that we're working in the correct environment. So we simply want to start the server that runs the notebook. We type Jupyter Notebook. And when we do this, we're going to see some output in the console, and then we're going to see our Jupyter. Uh, we're going to see Jupyter over in the browser over, browser over here. All right, we can go ahead and clear this out. Don't close it, but you can minimize the console if you want. And I'll just pull this over here so that it's so that we can still see the notes. What we have here is essentially a file listing. I've got I've created an example file that I'll be working with, but this is what pops open when you first open Jupyter. And if you have other files in this directory, they will be listed here as well. I've got a notebook already created of a simple example. It's telling me that that's available. And so to open it, I simply click on it and it will open in another browser. So what we see here is a simple interface. It's based on cells. Each cell is where you can write code or text and depending on the type of that cell, the type that that cell is defined as at the, at the current moment when you're typing in it or when you're using it, certain things will happen to that code. But before we get to that, let's first look across the top and see that we've got the basic file, edit view, insert stuff that you would expect. If you are familiar working with Google Docs, then the way that you change the name of the notebook will seem familiar. You just type in a new name and it will update. And that will also change the file name on the back end. Um, once you've been working with notebooks for a while, or once you've got a notebook laid out that does some analyses that you want it to do, you may want to download it as a pure Python script, or you may want to create it as Markdown or HTML. Those are things that will help you in sharing your code and displaying your code. You can even turn it into PDF if you like. And you can make a copy, which is useful if you're just iterating through a different few different versions of something and you want to keep your, it's sort of like branching if you're using uh, version control, making a copy can be helpful in just running a few different things, trying them out without destroying your original notebook and then getting rid of them if you want to keep them or not. A couple of handy things there. Also, something that's very useful and even after having used notebooks for a while, I still come to often is the help specifically for the keyboard shortcuts. Keyboard shortcuts are very helpful when you're working through notebooks and there are a good number of them that will serve you well if you learn them. I've got a few listed here over in the notes section. I'll post those also in the comments to the video, but these are the ones that I find most useful and the ones that I think that you'll benefit most from uh, learning as well. One thing to note about the note book interface is that it's essentially got two modes. It's got a command mode and an edit mode. When you're in command mode, you are doing actions on the cells, sort of like meta actions on the cells. So if you wanted to delete cells or create new cells, you would want to be in the command mode. If you want to actually type within the cells, you want to be in the edit mode. You can tell which mode you're in based on the color of this bar over here. So now you can see that we have a blue bar. We are in command mode. In command mode, if I type A, it will add a row or a cell above the current cell. In command mode, if I type DD, it will delete that cell. When I'm in command mode, if I push enter, it will take me into the current cell and I can start typing things like that. All right, so now I have some code pulled up here that we're going to use as an example. Another very helpful shortcut that you want to know is shift enter. When you are when a cell is highlighted, you click Shift Enter. It will run that cell. You can cell, but you can tell that it was running because there was a little asterisk that popped up there. And now we can see that it's completed because we have a one there. And so it skipped us down to the next cell. And I will click Shift Enter again, and it will run that cell. And we've created some toy data. And then now we're going to simply plot it. So this has just been a quick introduction to Jupyter Notebooks. Again, it's one of a few options that are out there. Feel free to go through and test some of those other options. After doing that, I came back to Jupyter Notebooks and part of the reason I came back is that it just works so well with the interactive approach that you often take when you're doing data science. The ability to run a model and then see some results or to do some data munging and then see some of the results very quickly. 
in a second video, we'll cover some of the bells and whistles that will add to Jupyter Notebooks, and we'll address some of the deficiencies with it when you're thinking it, when you're comparing it to something like RStudio. Now, we're obviously not going to get Jupyter Notebooks to be an RStudio clone, and that's not exactly a bad thing. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks can stand on its own if you're willing to sort of adjust the way that you think and approach code. One thing that I like about the cell-based approach is that it really forces you to keep your code in logical chunks and it helps you keep your code clean and concise. We'll do a second video that will really get into some of the additional things that you can add to Jupyter Notebooks and some of the advanced things that you can do with Jupyter Notebooks. And I think at that point it will make more sense why you should choose it over some of the other Python based options. But I certainly suggest that you give any option that initially looks like it might work for you a try. That's the way that you're going to decide what is best for you. And it may be that you value different parts of the workflow more than I do. So that's all I have today. Next time we'll be talking about pandas, we'll get into doing some code, and we'll really start taking off in our data science work. Thanks for listening. Have a great day or evening, whatever it is in your part of the world, and I'll talk to you next time.